hello. So we voice, voice can be heard. For this. Okay, so uh, children, before you uh, recite your papers, I would like you to come to the front. We're going to Jesus shine, shine Jesus shine. Right, you come forward, boys and girls. Song one hundred people shine Jesus. You can join to the to the voice and the
Come um.
Ani. Now okay. like uh, to to ease us into all our conversation money morning. Uh the love of money of all evil. Um, so what are the differences between money being the root of all evil and the love of money being the root of all evil? Are there any differences? What is there any difference between money being the root of all evil and the love of money being quick a quick one, quick one? But I'm seeing I'm not seeing a very I'm not seeing a lot of hands up. You know, is there any difference? Yes or no? Is there any difference between money being the root of all evil and the love of money being the root of all evil? There's a difference. So what's the difference? <laughs> what's the difference? Who can tell us? Okay, Sister Becky, very quickly. Love Money is the love of money. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Becky. So let's keep that at the back of our mind. Let's keep that at the back of our mind. And also, there are some, a lot of misconceptions as well, you know, especially stemming from this scriptural passage you know, about the love of money being the Almost deceiving in some quarters. Having money uh, is a bad thing. Is having money a bad thing? Do rich people go to heaven? Do rich people go to hell? Do poor people go to hell? Do poor people go to heaven? Aha, so if that's the case, then we know that money is not really the problem. It's our attitude to the money, you know, that we have to pay careful attention to. Let's open our Bible very quickly to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Verses 16, 22. Whoever finds it first can start reading. Matthew chapter 19. 16. And But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. Thank you very much. Sir. This is a very 
interesting piece of scripture. And it's interesting because um, it speaks about a young ruler. We all know the story. And um, it's, it's particularly inter- it was interesting to me because this person, this young ruler that came to Jesus, Jesus actually loved him. You know, Jesus actually loved this young ruler. But I don't think And then following the straight and narrow way, and God has opened doors, he has been able to acquire material wealth, and here Jesus is telling him to give away all that he had and follow him. It, it, it's almost like wickedness, isn't it? But we are told that Jesus actually loved this man. Jesus loved this man deeply, which just was why he gave that instruction. Can we, is, there, is there a way we can reconcile these, these two things? I mean, the, the instruction on the surface looks as if it's, it, it's coming from a, from a God who is not very caring. Because this is someone who has served this God for, from his youth, at, I mean, aligned with the commandment, and God has, he has been able to acquire material wealth, and now God is telling him to give it all away. And we are saying, actually, it was because God loves him. Can we reconcile these two things? How? How is that possible? Did God really love this man by telling him to give it all away, and how? How is that love? How is that love? Oh, do we understand the question? Okay, do we have any, anyone willing to answer? <laughs> I'll start calling names. <laughs> How is that love? Oh, we can't, Sister Faith, you want to try? Okay. <laughs> oh, the, oh, the question again. So this young, this young ruler, you know, he has been faithful, serving God all his life. And God has blessed him with material possessions. And you would think that that is a reward of righteousness, right? And at this point, Jesus Christ is telling him, give all of that material possession away and follow me. Is that, is that, is that wickedness or is that love? Amen. God, God bless you. But do we have more? Do we have anything more to say about that? Do we have anything more to say? Yes, Brad Darius. Amen. Mm-hmm. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. Bless you, man. <coughs> yes, bra. I'll take. Okay, Sister Becky, maybe you represent Bra Wally. I'll take one. <laughs> that last one. I just wanted to add that while Jesus was looking for his disciples, that was the same call he did unto them. He called them to leave all. So it was a show of love then for you to, for him to ask you to leave your job, those who had businesses to leave their businesses. And so he said to him, "Go and sell, give to the poor, and follow me." I'll take a short one from from from, from Bratobi, and that'll be the last one. You know.
Uh, sometimes we feel that we are at a particular level, but you know, through some of the experience and in the case of this young man, Christ was revealing to him that there are still areas in your life that you still have challenges, you know, and because and it showed that when Christ told him, go sell all and pack with those riches, he showed that his priorities was not Christ. Mm -hmm. He still had his eyes on those things. So sometimes God takes us through those experiences mm -hmm. to reveal our own real position. Amen. God bless you. This, this, this young ruler was actually guilty of 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. You know, that is the love of money being the root of all evil. So his eyes was on that wealth. And it makes, it, this passage made me remember the prayer of the psalmist that says, God, I don't want to have the kind of wealth that will take my eyes away from you. At the same time, don't make me so poor that I will curse you. You know, there are some kind of, there, there's our behavior to money can steal heaven away from some of us. And I pray that would not happen to any of us in Jesus' name. This man, even though he was keeping all the commandments, his eyes were on, that, on, on those possessions. And Jesus Christ saw it. And he saw that this, this, actu this attitude can actually steal heaven away from this man. And I love this man so much. I mean, he's a man who has kept the commandments from his youth. I love him so much that, you know, I don't want this to steal heaven away from him. And the young ruler also took his eyes away from, I mean, I think he lost, he lost the plot in the sense that he missed the last part where he says, You know, you know, and so many of us as well, I think sometimes. Heaven. May God help us. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Very quickly, let someone read it for us. First Timothy 6, 6. First Timothy 6, 6. Amen. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is, is great gain. Again, we are still looking at, you know, the love of money being the root of all evil versus money itself not, you know, not being evil. We are told that godliness with contentment is great gain. Today, what do we see around us? What do we see around us? They use people to love stuff. You know, they use people to be able to get wealth, serious wealth today. You need to be, you need to be a brutal businessman. You need to be willing to, you know, <laughs> you know to, I mean, to cut corners. You need to be able to use people to acquire wealth. So they use people to love stuff. And that's where the love of money comes in. Because their love is on the money. Their love is on the stuff. So as a result, they use people you know, to acquire that stuff, to acquire that wealth. But that's not what God expects of us as Christians. Rather, God expects us to use the stuff to love people. The direct opposite. Amen. May God help us. As this lesson is going on, let us ask ourselves, you know, is it a case of, in our day-to-day, -day, are we chasing this money at all costs? At the expense, at the expense of loving people, or are we, you know, are we trying to use the resources God has blessed us with, you know, to actually love people? Is, is that distinction is very, very important. May God help us. The next question I have here is, you know, does one's material wealth, you know, prove that they have the blessing of God? Does one's material wealth prove they have the blessing of God, and why? Does one's material wealth prove they have the blessing of God? It's in so many contemporary circles, not just in the world. In so many contemporary Christian circles, it's a case of our God is a rich God, you know. And if you're not, if you don't have that physical manifestation of wealth. It's a case of you are doing something wrong. Or, uh, you know, so does, does that wealth, having the biggest cars, having, you know, the biggest, I, I mean, amount of resources, is it a true demonstration, you know, that God's blessing is on one's life? And why? Who can tell us? Yes, ma'am. Amen. God's blessing in our heart. Amen. Amen. Because that's peace will be in our heart. Amen. God bless you. But let's open very quickly to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. 
Proverbs 10, 22. Proverbs 10, 22. Whoever finds it first can read for us. Proverbs 10, 22. Brawale. Twenty-two. It is as sport to a fool to do mischief. Ten twenty-two. Yeah. Proverbs chapter ten, verse twenty-two. Ten twenty-two. The blessings of the Lord it maketh rich, and addeth no sorrow with it. Amen. I think this answers that question. How many billionaires? of this world today can say they are truly rich without the addition of sorrow to it. Let's look around us. Let's look at the Forbes first, I mean, 100 most richest people in the world. How many of them can we put their life under the microscope and we can say, yes, you know, truly, you know, they have the blessing of wealth and there's no sorrow attached to it at all. It's difficult. It's difficult. I mean, look at the news. Even the ones who we thought, you know, were, you know, have very stable, very stable lives and very enviable lives. We hear the news of, of troubled homes, how their homes are troubled. You know, we hear the news of, you know, of, of how it's a facade. You know, a lot of these guys are depressed. A lot of these guys are, <laughs> you know, they, they survive on, uh, on, uh, on pills and things like that. But we are saying here that true blessing of God is the one that make it rich and has no sorrow. Sometimes, sometimes, of course, we know that money is important and God's intention is for us to be comfortable even as we run this race. But sometimes, even not, not, not being the richest man in the world and not having all of that money is God's protection over our life. It's a demonstration of God's love over our lives. And we have to also always bear that in mind. The way, the way, the way I see it is, and sometimes as well, we are just not, we're just not ready for it. I mean, that, that, that prayer of the psalmist always rings in my mind. You know, there's a certain amount of wealth that God can bless man with that will take his face away from God. I don't know if we agree. There's a certain amount of wealth that if, if either we are not spiritually mature or we are not spiritually ready for it, it can, the same way, I mean, I have a son right, right now, and, and no matter how much I love him, if, if I had the money, and he came to me and said, oh, dad, please buy me a Ferrari, and I, and I had the money to buy him a Ferrari, I think I would be very, very foolish to actually go and buy him a Ferrari. Because I know that even, <laughs> if, I, even if I have the money to buy him a Ferrari and I can afford it, that, that blessing is going to kill him at this stage. This is not the stage for it. And that is how God deals with us as well when it comes to this issue of money. You know, there are some of us that we need to get to a level of spiritual maturity where God can actually trust us enough to be a conduit of this blessing. And even when it's not there, it's still a demonstration of his love. Like, like a father not buying a Ferrari for, for a two-year-old. May God help us to understand. In what peace? In what peace? is a true demonstration of God's blessing, like we have heard. Inward peace and contentment. The wealth that, you know, that make it rich and adds no sorrow. The wealth that make it rich and add no sorrow. But at the same time, this money is still important. <laughs> this money is still important. I don't want us to forget about that. This money is still important because we need it. We need it. For us as Christians, a lot of times, we are very, we are very effective. We know, we know how to seek God's face. We are, we, are very, we are very efficient when it comes to seeking God's face for every other aspect of our lives. But when it comes to the principle of wealth, for us as Christians, sometimes we don't get it. We don't get it at all. When it comes to the principle of, and there's a principle to wealth. <laughs> there's a principle to wealth that we have to understand. The people of the world, they understand, some of them understand this principle to wealth. And even though they are in the world, they utilize this principle and it, and it, and it leads to abundance. It leads to abundance. 
Let's keep our memory verse in view, our key verse. You know, for the adults, let's keep it in view. It says, give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet without, it shall be measured to you again. This is a fundamental principle to wealth. This is a fundamental principle to wealth that a lot of Christians don't understand. And I pray that today God will give us a change of heart. God will give us a change of perspective. In what ways, in line, in line, with, in line with, with that key verse, it says, give and it shall be given unto you. In what ways do we give to God today? And with, in what ways can we give to God today? In what ways do we give to God today? And in what ways can we give to God today? Very, very quickly, in line with that fundamental principle. Give and it shall be given unto you. Yes, I think the fundamental one is we have to pay our tithes. Amen. When, when we walk and God blesses us, mm -hmm. we, we know the, we understand the principle of tithe. We should go by that. We also should give often mm -hmm. because um, tithe, we know, is, like I said, almost kind of mandatory. Mm -hmm. Offering is um, one that we do willingly, but mm -hmm. it's something we should always do. And also in uh, Proverbs 19.17, it says, mm -hmm. He that hath pity upon the poor, mm -hmm. lendeth unto the Lord. Amen. And that which he has given, will he pay it again? Amen. So also, there are people around us that Amen. God can lead us to. Amen. Uh, we just have to be attentive to his instructions and act accordingly. Amen. God bless you, Brahu. And and you mentioned tithe. Sorry, be, be, sorry, just a quick one. You mentioned tithe. What is tithe? How do we pay tithe? Okay, so um, tithe is what we pay on uh, our earnings. So if you are a salary worker, for example, we say, okay, one tenth, yeah, let me say that, it's one tenth of our earnings. Mm -hmm. So if you are a salary worker, for example, you get your pay, mm -hmm. on your gross pay, Amen. you should pay your tithe. Amen. It's on the gross. Emphasis. Amen. Yes. And then for a businessman, it's expected that you pay it on your gross profit, not on uh, your uh, base uh, um, sum for the business. I mean, not, but once you've done, you've done business and you realize that profit, God bless you. And how about offering? How do we pay offering? Is there a percentage to, to, to offering? No. Offering doesn't really have a percentage, but God can lead us, and it can come in different ways. Amen. You could, you can drop it in the tithes and offering box as well, mm -hmm. a certain amount, mm -hmm. or there could be a project going on in the church mm -hmm. that God would lay it on your mind that mm -hmm. this is, I want you to drop this amount for this project. Or, yeah, so God that. bless you, sir. You know, let us pay attention. These are fundamental principles for wealth creation, that if we miss it, a lot of people go through this life and thinking, thinking they can rob God. Is there, by the way, is there, is there anyone here who is, you know, people have bucket lists, right? Things they want to do before they die. And some people will say, oh, I want to go to Niagara Falls. Some will say, I want to jump out of the plane. Is there anyone here who would like to, to rob a bank, you know, as part of their bucket list? Is there anyone? I, I mean, I didn't think so. But there are people that rob God. And especially in this our day and age, there are a lot of erroneous doctrines. The Bible tells us, Paul tells us that there are doctrines of the devil about this tithe and offering. Doctrines of the devil that we have to be very, very careful about. People will come and tell you, oh, tithe is an Old Testament thing. You know, it's gone with the Old Testament. Have, have, have we heard things like that before? It's out there. Some people will tell you that, oh, uh, you know, when it comes to tithing, yeah, I can take my tithe and I can go and give it to the needy. I'm still paying tithe. Is that is that what the scripture instructs us? Let us let us read a couple of uh, scriptures so 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 so, so we are not speaking in isolation. Uh, very quickly, Proverbs chapter three verses nine and ten. Proverbs chapter three verses nine and ten. Uh, someone else Leviticus twenty seven thirty. Someone else Malachi chapter three verse eight, and someone else Matthew twenty three twenty three. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with thy first fruits of all thy increase. Ten, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Amen. God bless you. Leviticus chapter twenty-seven, verse thirty. Leviticus twenty-seven, thirty. Whoever finds it first can read for us. 
Leviticus 27 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. Amen. It is holy unto the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Malachi 3, 8. Anyone who finds it can read for us. So these are fundamental truths about Titan. Amen. God bless you, man. Then finally, Matthew 23, 23. Now, this is the New Testament. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted with your laws of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. This ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Amen. God bless you. So we know that paying tithe is a fundamental biblical instruction. A fundamental, earlier on I mentioned that there are, there are principles to wealth creation. Malachi, I think, put it very, very bluntly. We have seen that nobody here will rob a physical bank. But we, some people say it's okay to rob God's bank. And they think they are going to, you know, they can get away with it. May God help us, though. You know, we take, we take God's portion and then we mix it with the one that we use for ourselves. It becomes a curse. Leaky pockets. May God help us not to, be, not to be guilty of that. You know, we are expected to take our first fruit, like Brother Hope mentioned, that 10%. It is it's the one that we take out immediately. We just earmark it immediately for God. And also, we have to pay attention we don't, we don't, we don't keep it, and then after six months we we say we go and pay. We keep we keep God's tithe for six months. If God keeps our blessings for six months, uh, or God decides that oh you know what you are asking for 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 an immediate divine intervention, I'll keep my answer for six months, and then in six months time I'll give it to you. How are we going to feel? So may God help us and open our eyes to some of these things. What are some of the other benefits of? Of not robbing God in Titan offering. What are some of the other benefits of not robbing God in Titan offering? What are some of the benefits? Yes. Just like in everything, in obeying and honoring God, he, st he said that He will take away the devourers from us. You know, He will not. Uh, you know, and then He also takes care of other things for us. You know, the health, our health, and other areas of our life. You know, there are things that. You know, he doesn't get. He he has promised that you know, as you bring the tithe, there will be food in my house. And then he also promised that um, any he will take care of things concerning that concerns us generally. Amen, amen. Those are his promises. Do, do we have any more? One more, yes, sir. One of the uh, benefits of paying our tithe is that uh, when we are in trouble, he gives us a clear conscience to approach God. Amen. And uh, he, I don't know, maybe about this testimony of a brother that was sick in, in Nigeria and he was praying and praying and praying he, was, he wasn't getting healing until the Spirit of God moved the man of God one I think the overseer there said how about your tithe and the man said oh I've not paid my tithe I've not been paying my tithe <laughs> he has to go and borrow money to pay that tithe and he got the healing so he gives us clear mind to approach the throne of God. Amen. God bless you, sir. And these are secrets. These are fundamental secrets. There are tons of examples, though. <laughs> Personally, which, I, which I'm privy to, there are tons of examples. There are people of the world who we know, 
you know, they are not our church members, but they come and pay tithes to our church. There are people like that, and they don't miss their blessings. They don't miss their victory. This script, this key verse, is a fundamental principle. We look at the billionaires of this world. One of them has pledged the half of his whole entire wealth. Half of his whole entire wealth is going to charity. One man. You know, one man has independently donated over 50 billion US dollars. This is a fact and figure. To charity. One man independently saying, you know what, I just want to eradicate this particular disease from existence. No strings attached. One man. I, I, I mean, as far as we, we, we know anyway. And since he made that pledge, his wealth has grown. This man is still top three richest man, man in the world. And how come? This is a fundamental principle. May God help us and open our eyes. Not to rob God. The early disciples understood this principle. You know, the early disciples, the early Christians, they understood this. We were told that they had everything in common. They had everything in common. They shared everything. There was such that there was none among them that, that was lacking. There was none among them that was needy. Because they understood the principle of the fact that when God blesses you with stuff, you use that stuff to love people. And there's no way you can run out. Yes, Brother Dario. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. God bless you. We don't we don't pay tight because because we are expecting something in return. We don't, it's not tit for tattoo. Even though we know that God has promised us here that he will open the windows of heaven. But it's not, when we give, we don't, it's not tit, tit for tat. Some people, when they give, they, it's tit for that. Yes, Brother Victor. Amen. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your wine cast the fruit before the time of in the fields, said the Lord of hosts. Amen. And all nations shall call you blessed, mm -hmm. for ye shall be a delightful land, said the Lord of hosts. Amen. God bless you, sir. This is God's word. This is God's practical word. Another analogy I like to use is the analogy of a hedge fund manager. You know, a hedge in, in today's world, when we look at a hedge fund manager, you know, it's someone that, you know, you give your money to, and this person will take your money and will go and invest your money and make more money for you. So you take your money, you go and give it to a hedge fund manager, they invest that money and make more money for you. And how do you know a good hedge fund manager? You know, a good hedge fund manager is the one that can, it's not the one that will collect your money and keep it to himself. That's a very, very bad hedge fund manager. You know, so he takes that money, identifies opportunity, and spends that money on your behalf. And that money brings results. And because it's bringing results, you take more money and give to that hedge fund manager. That is how it works in the world. You know, and that hedge fund manager, even in the process of you using your money, investing your money, and making more money, he also takes a portion for himself as well, to take care of himself, isn't it? But if the hedge fund manager takes the whole thing and eats it for, for, for himself, are you going to give him more money? Our relationship with God is exactly that way. We are hedge fund managers. We are hedge fund managers. You know, God takes his resources, invests it in us, and then he's watching us. <laughs> How are you going to use it? Some people take everything and then they spend on themselves. And they expect more from That's a bad hedge fund manager. Or some people take that money and just, they just sit on it. They keep it. That's a bad hedge fund manager. Meanwhile, some people take that money and invest the spot needs around them. I think the, the answer class gave, a, gave, gave, gave an example about Thelma. See, you, 
That man will not see a need and not do something about it. God places needs in front of us all the time. All the time. And he empowers us to be able... I really like that example of Thelma because... You know, she will not see a need and not do something, no matter how big that need is. And this Thelma was not a billionaire. Even if it means putting a quarter huh, into the hand of, I mean, a hand of someone, or $10 into the hand of someone, it may not, the person may be looking for $20,000, but it's putting $10, and that $10 will make a dent in that, pro- whether we realize it or not. But Thelma will never see a need and look there and say, no, this one I'm not empowered enough to be able to meet this need. That's the reaction of a lot of Christians. God places needs in front of us all the time, but feel, the resources required to be able to meet this is too much. It's beyond me. No, this one is for someone else. <laughs> we leave the, ble- the, the blessings for someone else to, you know, to get it instead of contributing our widow's mind. May God help us. We are God's hedge fund managers. And if we don't use the resources he has blessed us with, if we don't use it to bless people around us, if we don't give returns to him as well, we don't pay our tax, there's no way he will invest more into us. I, I mean, as human beings, you, you, you have a hedge fund manager, there's no way you take more money and give that person. You will not put money into that fund. And we expect God to put money into our own fund. A lot of people, they go through life in penury because they miss this principle. May God help us. Sometimes we pray for victory. Oh, God, give me this job. Oh, God, do this for me. Oh, God, do this for me. <laughs> you know, God does it. <laughs> and then we forget all about it. We think it's our own power that has helped us to achieve. Or, or you know, a door God, God has opened. We now think it is left to us to do all we can to secure that door so we don't lose the opportunity. And we forget who opened the door in the first instance. May God help us. There's an indescribable joy, you know, that comes from giving. There's an indescribable joy that comes from not giving with the mindset of fit for tat. And not giving out of our abundance. A lot of people give out of their abundance. There's something that, yeah, I mean, somebody, you have, you have a thousand dollars and then you give two dollars. It doesn't make a dent. It's out of your abundance. We are not proving God if that's what we are doing. We are not proving God. He says, prove me now here with. We are not proving God. Because out of our abundance, there are several testimonies of one of our brothers in Southern Africa that, you know, when, when he was starting his career, he pledged to God that God, half of my wages is going to you. That's a radical faith. That's a radical process to prove God. He said, half of my wages is going, this is a young man just starting off his career, he's not even married and, and things that has so many things to do. And he proved God. And this man, when God started to open the windows of heaven, he became one of the most valuable people in the country. Owned the insurance company, owned the mine, owned huge farms, owned the bank. I mean, this is the reality. This is the reality. Prove God. May God help us to understand this this framework. Now, in line with, we're rounding up now, in line with our our key verse, is there anyone who has experienced our key verse? You know, our key verse says, give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, press down, shaking together, and running over. Now, we are not talking abstractly. We want to bring it home. Is there anyone who has experienced our key verse? This is our key verse. Is there anyone here who feels it has been manifested in his life? You have given and it has been given back onto you, full measure, press down, shake it together, running over. Is there anyone here? So that it's, it doesn't look abstract. Or are we speaking abstract talk? Is there any, I'm, I'm not saying that. It seems like we have not experienced the blessing of God. Yes, sir, bro. Bro, I remember when I was uh, in Nigeria in a bank and uh, the bank was going through a difficult time. Then I was paying my tithe, 10 cents. Then I decided that, Lord, I want to pay the, my tithe based on the next level. Mm-hmm. 
in terms of my grade. Amen. I want to pay, I'll be paying my tithe in the next level, as in two levels. Amen. And uh, I was calculating the, uh, what is it called, the package for two grades above, three, no, two grades above me. And I was doing that, it took some time. Amen. I was almost like, this is not easy. But you know, it got to a time where the bank was downsizing. Hmm. And they were asking people to leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, in God's, in a miraculous way, I had a target. And someone just came from nowhere. I called him Baba and he said, I want to invest this money. And he gave me that money, which is times to the budget or the target for yeah. that branch. Amen. And straight away, people were asked to go. And I was promoted to that two level. Amen. And it was like, I, I, actually, I forgot about it. I didn't remember that I was doing that. Mm. It was like two, three months later, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm already earning this money. Mm -hmm. And I was paying that tithe. Mm -hmm. So that was the miracle I experienced myself. Amen. So this thing happens. It says, for with the same measure shall you, that, that you meet out without shall be measured to you again. That's a practical example. It's not abstract talk at all. Very quick one, Sister Becky. Very, very quick one. A couple of years ago, when I started my career, uh, one morning, I heard that there was a, a Muslim mob that was going towards our house. Mm. And um, my, my house was burnt. They were looking for my parents to kill, you know, down the knot and everything. And I had been giving money to my dad, and he was building a place. So that building was, was pulled down. But that morning, I didn't have any money, and they paid us 30,000 naira. Mm. And you can imagine how I felt that I had been paid my tithe and that incident had happened and all of that. Mm. So I took a tenth of that 30,000 naira mm. and I took it to church and I paid it. And I said, God, it doesn't matter what we are going through, I'm going to pay. Mm. I can tell everyone that in less than one year, every material thing that we had lost, mm. God had replaced it with Amen. a double fold. Amen. So if you're going through things, mm. you should pay your tithe. Amen. God bless you. God bless the Becky. Okay, oh, yes, very, very quick one. Very, very quick, yeah. So this happened so many years ago when I got my first job here mm -hmm. in Toronto. And mm -hmm. around that time, that was when I learned um, uh, the, the first fruits, mm -hmm. the lesson. And um, my mom encouraged me to mm -hmm. pay my first fruits. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it wasn't so easy for me because mm -hmm. then I, I was much younger and I was mm -hmm. like, why do I have to do this? At least I pay tight. Mm -hmm. But I thank God I was able to pay. Mm -hmm. And... Um, a few years later, the company was downsizing during mm -hmm. the restructuring recession, mm -hmm. and I was afraid mm -hmm. because even people who had more qualifications, mm -hmm. they got laid off. Amen. I was afraid. I wasn't sure. My mom, my mom was like, "Okay, keep praying. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is going to be okay." Mm -hmm. This happened 2008. I mean, the um, the layoff, the restructuring, 2008 and 2010, and mm -hmm. I wasn't affected. And I'm like, I don't even have half of the qualifications so people who were let go had. Hmm. So that's one miracle that happens to me, you know, by listening to God. Amen. God bless you, man. And sometimes it doesn't always come back as money. Sometimes it comes as good health. Brother, we're out of time now. But, you know, I pray that God will, the Spirit of God will really reveal these things to us. It comes as victories. It comes as protection. Can we buy protection? Medical doctors of this world, when it's their time to go, they die. But God... I mean, he, he keeps us. So it doesn't always come back as, as, as money, as sometimes it does. And this, this thing about our disposition to money is not only reserved for those, for those who are working on. Children, I also encourage to have the same approach. I mean, the same approach we are speaking about to money. Even those who, who, who are, you know, who, who may see themselves as needy, they need to have these approaches. So no one is, no one is excluded. I'm praying that this morning, we don't even have much time, but the Holy Spirit will come and, uh, you know, and expand share this word in our heart. You know, and that as we strive to be conduit of God's blessing, as we strive to be instrument of God use, God's use, as we strive to tell God that, God, I am your hedge fund manager. I am your hedge fund manager. You know, if you give me these resources, I will be an instrument of purpose in your hands. I will be an instrument of use in your hands. Let us prove God. And then see him, I mean, unfold the windows of heaven on our, I mean, on, on, on all of us. And I pray that he does that for us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless us all. Uh, we'll call on Brother Hope to give us a, a quick close of prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your message that you have sent to us this morning. May your name be praised. We thank you because once again you have taught us the secret of these things. 
that many out there are not aware of. We pray, O Lord, that you help us to be able to put them to you. We pray, O Lord, that you make us conduits uh, of blessings to others. Make us a channel of blessings, O Lord. Like uh, the, the analogy has used where our hedge fund manager, Lord, please help us to manage your wealth well. Oh Lord, let us listen to you and let us obey you. And most importantly, please take us to heaven at last, for we pray in Jesus' name.